بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين وبعد رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي وبعد إبراهيم عليه السلام from a young age he was made to search for the truth. So as a teenager, Allah tells us in the Quran how Ibrahim alayhi salam questioned the fact that his people were worshipping idols. And that shows that Ibrahim alayhi salam had his fitrah, his fitrah. It was in good shape. And one of the aspects of fitrah is that it asks questions. It asks questions. It wants to know. There's a thirst for knowledge. There's a quest for answers. That's the fitrah. It wants to know. It searches for the truth. It recognizes that what it has is not enough and it wants more. It wants more. So at a young age, he was questioning, why do my people do this? What is the point worshipping statues made of, s of stones? What's the point? What, how does this help us? Why do we give our devotion, our love, our fear to these idols? Yes, everyone does it. But I'm not going to accept that as a fact and live with it. There is something inside me that tells me there is more to this. So that's a good sign. If a person is asking questions, that's a good sign. Now, I will be going with you to the time of Ibrahim alayhi salam, but we will be frequently coming back to our time. Because by the way, stories in the Quran, stories from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, they're not for entertainment. It's not like we hold the mushaf in our hands, we read, and we look at the story, we understand how the story goes, end of story. That's not the point. Because life is the same. Life is the same. Human experience at any time in history, in any place, there's a lot of similarities. If you strip it down to its inner experience, it's the same. Maybe the clothes differ. Maybe skin color differs. Maybe the race differs. The language differs. Lifestyle differs. But at the end of the day, it all boils down to the same thing. We all have the same experience. Even regardless of the technological level, human experience will end up being the same. So it's essentially, if you take it down, strip it down to its essence, the human experience will always be the same. The same emotions, the same feelings, the same thoughts, the same experiences, the same challenges, the same inner conflict, the same thing. So we will be traveling to the time of Ibrahim alayhi salam and then coming back to our time and see what is Allah telling us when he narrates the story to us. What is the point? Because that's what we call in Arabic Tadabbur. Tadabbur. Tadabbur, which is also similar to Tafakkur. Allah actually says in the Quran that he sent down the Quran for the purpose, Jazakallah khairan, he sent the Quran down for Tadabbur. The reason Allah sent down the Quran, the main reason for tadabbur. So we do tadabbur, we engage in tadabbur. Allah says in Surah Sad, Kitabun anzalnahu ilayka mubarak liyadabbaru ayatihi wa liyatadhakkara ulul albab. A blessed book that we send down unto you, O Muhammad, so that they, who are they? Everyone, humans. So they make tadabbur over the Quran, pondering, reflection, 
deep thinking. And one of the meanings of tadabbur is you study something, you understand it, then you take the lessons into your life and you see how they apply. That's part of tadabbur. It's called in Arabic, ibra. Ibra. Allah says, for example, in, in Surah Yusuf, after he mentions the whole story of Yusuf in the Surah, Allah says, لَقَدْ كَانَ فِي قَصَصِهِمْ Who can complete? لَقَدْ كَانَ فِي قَصَصِهِمْ عِبْرَة عِبْرَةٌ لِأُولِي الْأَلْبَابِ In their stories, there is عِبْرَة There is عِبْرَة for people of understanding. What does عِبْرَة mean? عِبْرَة, who, who speaks Arabic or knows Arabic here? Okay, so Ibra in the Arabic language comes from Ubur. Ubur means to cross a bridge. Cross a bridge. So for the stories that Allah mentions in the Quran are for us to understand them, dissect them, learn the lessons, then cross over to our life and see how this applies. What does it teach us? How does it enlighten us? And how does it change our life? And then act upon this. That's how we do tadabbur. So we will try to do this. So Ibrahim alayhi salam, as a young boy, he's a young man, he was reflecting on his state. He did not take the practice of his people, unanimous, all his people, all of them were doing it. And you know, as human beings, when you grow up in a society and you grow up into something, you see everyone's doing it, for you it becomes true and good automatically. So that shows Ibrahim alayhi salam, his very human nature, which is fitra, was actually not accepting this. It was pushing against this. It was pushing against this. Because we humans, by the way, we don't just learn from society. We have another source of learning. We have another source of learning. And we are born with it. When you are born as a child, it's inside of you. It's inside of you. Even if you grow up in a society that oppresses the weak and everyone is doing it, there is a voice inside you that says, no. Where does this come from? Allah put it inside you. That's your fitra. That's your fitra. We call it conscience, right? We call it conscience. I don't know what's the word in your local language. In, in Arabic, it's damir. It's, it's this intuitive feeling that takes you towards what's good, guides you towards what's good, right? So Ibrahim السلام, had this inside of him, and he said, that's not true. These are just stones. Why do we worship them? What's the point? Even if you... Say, oh, they're just stones, but they connect us to the creator of the heavens and the earth. Why go through them, right? Because people of Quraysh, they were not stupid, by the way. You think they were just thinking these idols are real gods by themselves? No. They said, these are symbols of righteous people of the past that were connected to Allah, so we are good to them. And because we're good to them, Allah will be good to us. Or they will intermediate between us and Allah. They will help us with Allah. That was the problem of Quraysh. They were not stupid people worshipping a table. No, they were not stupid by the way. They understood that. And the same applies to the people of Ibrahim. So the people of Ibrahim, Ibrahim did not accept that. And he started searching. His fitra was searching this world, there must be an originator, a creator for it. Who is this God? Who is he? Where is he? He must make himself known. Where is he? So he started looking around. Ultimately, Ibrahim salam was given the guidance by Allah. And he tried to communicate this with his people. But obviously, like everyone else, you know, you want to start a new project. You want to do something different. Everyone will say, no, you know, no one is going to accept that. No one does things this way. You just follow everyone else. You know what the problem, what's the problem with following everyone else? Is you will end up being like everyone else. And doesn't mean you just choose to be different. 
for the sake of being different. That's another problem. Being different is not a goal. It's not a goal. But if you are following your fitrah, you're searching for the truth, and that makes you different, then good, be it. That's the kind of diff being different that we want. Okay. So Ibrahim alayhi salam, we know the story that since he communicates with his people, they don't get it, they don't understand it. They said, you know, enough with it. We don't want to listen to you. Stop bothering us. Stop talking to us about another God and about how our way of life is no good. And that tells you something about humans, by the way. That tells you something about humans. When humans develop a lifestyle and habits, they don't like you to challenge it. So you are a young man or a young woman. You start practicing. You start learning a little bit about Islam. Then... You look at your parents, they're doing something wrong, right? It's traditional. They learned that from their parents, from the culture. So you think, hmm, I care about my parents, so I'm going to fix them. I know. So you go and speak to your parents, <laughs> and you get put down, right? What do you know? How old are you? Listen to your elders, right? Well, that's the nature of human beings. It's the nature of human beings. That when we live with something, we get used to it, it becomes the truth. And when someone comes and questions that, we're not going to accept it. We won't accept it. You actually become this niche in the house. You know what this niche is? Snitch. Okay, so snitch is a person, you know when young brothers, you know when you are maybe 14, 15, 16, you get together five, six brothers together, you say, you know, we wonder how, how smoking feels. You know, let's go and get some cigarettes and try to smoke and don't tell no one, right? You go and hide somewhere and you start lighting cigarettes and you smoke and you start coughing, right? And you say, hey, this is our secret. Don't tell no one. Then the following day, you find the school teacher. He says, Muhammad, Khalid, so-and-so, come here, come here. How does the cigarette taste? How did he know? One of you told on you. One of the guys went to the teacher. Or maybe went to your father. <laughs> Worse or your mother, and tell them about your smoke and trying the cigarettes. That's the snitch. So when you tell people you're wrong, that's not the way you pray, okay? Oh, you should pray like this. You don't say this like that. You say it this way. For them, you become this snitch. They don't want to listen to you. They want to prove you wrong now. And this is why... It's human nature. So don't think that if you try to teach some people, and sometimes it happens with parents. Like sometimes a parent, they did not like grow very religious, but later on in their life, they start practicing. But their kids are not practicing because they did not educate them. They did not teach them to be practicing. So now the parent wants their kid to start practicing. So they start telling their child, oh, did you pray Isha? Did you pray Fajr? Did you make wudu? Why don't you put on your hijab? Why don't you go to the masjid? Why don't you join the congregational prayer? Right? And the kid says, you know, leave me alone. Don't waste my time. Like, don't bother me. Now, the father or the mother becomes the snitch here. So, this is human nature. It doesn't mean you're wrong, but it means it's human nature to push back against what they are used to. So as a person who's trying to be a good Muslim, you should appreciate this in people. Expect it. Expect it. As a young man or a young woman, you learn something new, you go advise your parent, and they say, no, what do you know? That's wrong. That doesn't mean your parent is bad. It doesn't mean they don't want the truth. You know, I get, I get a lot of the youth, they say, my dad, he doesn't love the truth. He rejects the hadith of the Prophet or he rejects the Quran. Why? I told him, 
You know, when you pray, you don't put your hands down there, you put them here. And the Prophet ﷺ, I quoted the hadith for the him, the Prophet ﷺ used to put his hands on his chest, right? So my dad refuses the hadith. I say, brother, take it easy. Take it easy. Like his, his whole life he's been praying like this. Now all of a sudden, you make his whole religion collapse. <laughs> How is that going to feel? He's a human being. So be patient. Be patient. The Prophet ﷺ was with his people for such a long time. And... They harmed him and they put him through so many trials. Then at the end of the day, what does the Prophet ﷺ say? He says, Allahumma ghafir li qawmi fa innahum la ya'lamun. He says, oh Allah, forgive my people. They don't really know. They don't really understand. Okay? So keep in mind, keep in mind that that's the nature of humans. So they pushed against Ibrahim alayhi salam. And Ibrahim decided to communicate the message in another way. Communicate the message in another way. How? Because for them, they worship these stones thinking that if you respect them, if you give devotion to these idols, you're gonna, you, you will be good. They will take care of you. And so on and so forth. So he wanted to challenge this. So they were going on a trip maybe for hunting or something, they go out, he stays in town, and he says, I'm, I'm sick. They go out, he takes the axe, he goes to their gods, and he starts banging at them, destroying them, except for the biggest one, the biggest one. And what does he do? He hangs the axe on the biggest idol, now these people, you can imagine, I'm gonna tell you how it feels, okay? Imagine you travel out of KL, you go to Lenkawi for vacation, you come back, you find your local masjid is destroyed or burnt. How do you feel? And it's a masjid, it's a building. What happened? Okay. So, what about their own gods? So they were shocked. And it's not only like their idols are being like destroyed. Like they're destroyed, but one of them is still in good shape. And it's got the axe around its neck. So, it gets them to think. Like, what happened? Like, if, if someone destroyed them, why didn't this person destroy everything? Again, you want to get people's attention, what do you do? You do something unexpected and something that does not, does not make full sense to them. Does not make full sense to them. So, why? Because... Someone would expect if, if anybody's going to destroy the idols, they, they should destroy all the idols. But being unexpected, that gets people to think. That gets people to think. So this is something outside of our topic. If you want to stand out, you want to be remembered, stand, do something unexpected. But, again... Just like being different, not for the sake of doing anything. So there are people who do something different or they puzzle others, but they do bad things or they do things that are not good for them. So it's not just about doing something unexpected, but it's unexpected, but it has a profound message. Ibrahim alayhi salam wanted them to question why the biggest one of their idols is still there and why is the axe around its neck? But Ibrahim had thought through it. Like he was many steps ahead of them. So they, they're puzzled. They say, what happened? One of them remembers. He says, you know, we had this young man, Ibrahim. This young man, Ibrahim. He used to say bad things about our gods. So I think it's him. Go and fetch him. They bring Ibrahim and they say, What's ha what happened? He said, you know, ask them, they're your gods, right? 
they benefit you and if you do not give them worship they will harm you right so they're animated ask them so the quran actually mentions that this puzzles them they say how can we ask them like they don't respond they don't respond so now he's getting them to question now they can't even answer a question how are they going to benefit us why do we give devotion to them that's the first one that's not enough he's got a long plan for them so then he says well i mean look all of them are destroyed one of them is intact and he's got the axe on top so it seems that big one did it and he got them to say something that proves his point so they said laqad alimta as in the quran laqad alimta ma haula yantiqun you know that these don't talk he says aha they don't even talk why do you worship them they're helpless right so he said so maybe qala fa'alaha kabiruhum it's the biggest one of them did it you can tell look at it he's got the axe and he's good then they realized this was his own game but it got them to think it was a moment of truth but they rejected it fine they took ibrahim they said okay we're going to give him the worst type of punishment so they piled up a huge amount of wood and they lit a huge fire so they wanted him to throw they wanted to throw him in the fire and guess what they can't even get close to the fire it's too hot they can't get close enough to put him in the fire so they think about how can we get him into the fire so what do they do they create a big sling catapult you know the sling what is a sling you know when you have the two twigs you have the rubber on them you shoot stones they put him in one of those one of the bigger ones and then they throw him into the fire and ibrahim alayhi salam says one word hasbi allah wa ni'ma al wakil hasbi allah and he says allah is enough for me and he's the best disposer of affairs allah allah is enough for me by the way uh science today in our time whether it's we're talking about uh, physics chemistry uh, electronics biology even the humanities there's a lot of good in them but they have science today has this arrogance that it gives you the impression that people of the past were stupid and primitive people in the past had tools they could build huge buildings they could make great constructions they had sophisticated medicine they had, they they had co- complex lifestyles they had government system go- uh, systems of government and they had quite a good level of technology not necessarily electronic but they had powerful tools so don't think like sometimes people are surprised like did they have like these big machines at the time of ibrahim so they could throw him in the- yeah they had this there's a lot that humanity had but science today gives us the impression that humans were stupid <laughs> they were not they were not okay So Ibrahim Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends the fire peaceful for him and cool we're getting close to the Isha prayer anyway then Ibrahim travels he leaves them and he travels and he travels where was Ibrahim first question and I have some gifts I want to give them out brother Ammar said uh, I can give those out so I want to give this basket back empty So Ibrahim where was he before when he was young when he was a child with his father where was he put your hand up don't shoot where was Ibrahim where did he where was he born where did he grow up where 
Huh? Iraq. Okay, put your hand up next time. But I'm going to give you some candy. Oops, sorry. Okay. Is it okay if I throw it? That's cool? All right. I don't want to break any cultural norms, so tell me. Because I don't want to be a snitch. So you guys tell me. In Ur, in Iraq, yes. In the north of Iraq, what's known today as northern Iraq. What is the name of the father of Ibrahim? Again, don't shoot. You're going to miss your gifts. Put your hand up. The name of the father of Ibrahim. Yes. Azar, yes. I can't throw, so I'll ask someone to pass it on. Would you pass it on? Okay, so Ibrahim travels from Iraq to where first? Put your hand up. Palestine. Me and you are from the same culture. I can do it. <laughs> Okay, so Palestine, and he marries a woman. Her name is the first one? Sarah. Sarah, okay. Kit Kat or M&M's? Kit Kat, okay. Jazakallah khair. Okay, if I throw it? Good, mashallah. Okay. He goes with Sarah to... You said it without putting your hands up, so no gifts. Egypt. And there there was a tyrant. His name or his title was An-Namrud. An-Namrud. He has a big argument with Ibrahim alayhi salam. But An-Namrud had an issue. It's very, it's very strange. It's very strange. Do you know some Muslims, and it happens a lot in the West, You'll find a Muslim, he has a shop, he sells alcohol, and he uh, puts his money in the bank, and he takes interest, riba, and he uses riba and everything, right? And sometimes he or his family, they drink alcohol, and then... Someone invites them to McDonald's or some chicken. They say, is it halal? <laughs> Strange, right? Strange. How, like, man, you're doing everything. They say, no, I don't eat, I don't eat non-halal food. But you drink alcohol, right? <laughs> so it happens, humans. An namrud had something similar. An namrud would... If he saw a woman and he liked the woman, he would, even if she's married, he would take her to himself. And he would, if she was married, he would divorce her from her husband. But if she had a father or a brother, he would not take her without the permission of her father or her mother. Halal. Only halal, right? So, Ibrahim, before going to Egypt, he knows. He knows. And that means when you go into a country, it's important to understand the rules, the norms, how people think, what are the meanings of things. You know, in certain countries, this means... Hi, right? Or thank you. In other countries, it's rude to put your hand in someone's face. Yeah. So it's important to understand what meanings. Well, I, you know, I'm telling you this. I should have done my homework. I'm throwing candy before knowing whether it's appropriate or not. But anyways, because I never thought about it. I never, Ammar never told me that I was going to hand sweets. Taib. When Ibrahim goes and meets a Namrud, because he has to meet him, Ibrahim looks at the Namrud 
And Namrud sees the wife of Ibrahim, Sarah. Ibrahim can tell that An Namrud likes Sarah. He knows what's going to happen now. He knows what's going to happen. So, An Namrud says, Who's this? Ibrahim says, My sister. My sister. Now, he knew. That's why he said. Because if he said, she's my wife, Ibrahim, the Namrud would kill Ibrahim and take his wife. So he said, she's my sister. Did he lie? Well, you could consider it a lie, but this is something called Al... It's... It's not lying, it's, it's a white lie. <laughs> he basically meant she's my sister in Islam. That's what he means. <laughs> it's called Al Muwara. Al Muwara. Al Muwara. The Prophet used it sometimes. Yeah? So you don't have to lie. If you can use something that has double meaning, you intend one, but you know that person is going to understand the other meaning. It's called a pun in English, right? Pun. You can use pun. Yeah. So Ibrahim said, she's my sister. So an could not take her. Without the permission of Ibrahim, and obviously, it didn't, like he did not ask for her. So Ibrahim saved himself from, and Namrud saved his wife. So that shows us the importance of knowing the people you're dealing with and what things mean to them. Sometimes it's respect. Let me tell you about the Arabs. You know, if, if you go to an Arab's house, they're going to ask you, where are you from? What do you do? How many kids do you have? What do you like eating? What you don't like eating? Would you like doing this? And they will get into your business. They will get into your life. Why? Because for them, in Arabic culture, it's courtesy, it's kind and generous to get to know people and ask them. In other cultures, after the salah, inshallah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. Wa ba'du. So we were saying that in certain countries, just Arab countries, that a sign of generosity is that they will get into your business. They will ask you what you like, what you don't like, how many kids do you have, what's their name, where did you go yesterday, what did you eat for breakfast. It's a sign of that they really care. But in other cultures, if you do that, like, why are you questioning me? Like, why are you getting into all of my business? So it's good to appreciate these cultural differences. Generally speaking, in, in the Eastern world, you know, it's a sign of politeness that you speak with a soft voice, especially with strangers. Good morning. Thank you. And you don't have eye contact, right? If you maintain eye contact, they feel suspicious. They don't feel comfortable. Why are you eyeing them, right? Generally speaking, in the West, if you behave like this, they say, hey, you're up to something. This guy is hiding something. Those who lived in the West, they probably recognize this. So you think you are coming across polite, but you're actually raising doubts about yourself People feel suspicious about you. That you're no good. You're hiding something. You put your eyes down because you don't have the guts to let me look into your eyes. That's not what you mean, but cultural differences. So for example, I tell you how people can trust you in, in the West in general. How? You say, you see them? Strangers. Good morning. How are you? Beautiful day. What are you up to? They will open up they will speak and they will feel comfortable. But here, if you say to someone, how are you? It's a beautiful day. I'll say, well, what does this guy want? Right? 
cultural differences. Ibrahim alayhi salam got into this country, into Egypt. He knows what's going on. He knows how this man thinks. So he wants to be able to navigate this. Navigate it. So anyway, the encounter with an namrud the king of Egypt, is over. But he gives Ibrahim alayhi salam a gift. And the gift was a slave girl, a maid. And her name was, put your hand up if you know. Okay, good answer, but no gift. <laughs> so, Hajar, yes. Some narrations indicate that actually Hajar was the maid of Sarah, and Sarah gave her to Ibrahim. She freed her, and she said, you marry her, because she could not have children. They did not have children for a long time. They go back to Palestine. Ibrahim marries Hajar. Hajar gets pregnant. She gives birth to baby Ismail. Allah instructs them to go to where? Ibrahim should take Hajar and her son Ismail where to? Put your hands up. Where to? Uh, I was going to give you a gift, but again, patience. Patience. When, wait until I pick you. Okay? Type. So, Ibrahim is commanded to take Hajar and her son Ismail to Mecca. Mecca at the time was a dead place. There was nothing. There, were sm there was a small tree there. That's it. There was no people, no civilization, not even springs of water. Nothing. Ibrahim traveling imagine no cars at the time right no facilities traveling he takes hajar with her son ismail he puts them there in that place it's like a small valley he puts them there he turns around walks away now hajar looks she says where are you going obviously he's going to he's on a he's on another trip now she realized he's leaving. He's not coming back. Where are you going? Where are you leaving us to? He doesn't give an answer. But though this is a family of the prophet Ibrahim. So it's not like you and me. Okay? They're, they're, they're functioning at a different level. So she realizes he's not responding. It's not that, oh, maybe he's upset. Or maybe I said something wrong. She knows there's something bigger than this. She, said, she sees he's not answering. She knows there is something behind it. And she knows it has to do with his mission as a prophet. So she asks him a question. She says, she says Allahu amaraka bihada. Is it Allah who commanded you to act like this? He nodded and kept going. What did she say? Allah will not let us down. It's not like she's acting nice, saying something good. No, no, she wasn't. She really believed Allah is going to take care of us. It's like, <laughs> let me share with you this. I receive sometimes emails of people having problems. So a typical thing, typical email is about like if I were to print it out, it would be three, four pages. And then at the end of the email, oh, sorry for sending such a long email. Okay, that helps. But anyway, in the email, really like a brother or a sister going through so much trouble in their life. Like, I'll give you a typical example. You know, I've 
been, I had a tough life. My parents, for example, there was a sister, a mother. She's an older sister now. So she says, my parents were very abusive. They were harsh. And uh, finally, I got married. And I thought, you know, trouble would be over. So I'm with my husband. My husband turns out to be physically abusive. He hits her. He doesn't, doesn't treat her well, right? And my marital life turns to, turns to be bad, painful, hell, suffering. I have my first kid. I have my second child. And I want to leave, but I can't leave because of the kids. So I stay in the relationship. And my husband is disrespectful, abusive, but I have to be patient for the sake of my kids. And I had depression, developed depression. Then comes in the close. But I don't complain, alhamdulillah, for everything. Then, yes, and I go to the psychiatrist and they give me medication. But medication has side effects and it doesn't work all the time. So they have to change the medication. They give me antidepressants. They give me this. They change that. And... I have problems with my siblings because of the inheritance. There's a dispute and it, it gets my husband fired up and now there's more problems. And the kids are becoming teenagers, they're having issues. My, my son is doing this, is doing that and they're not obedient. And like I have no one to turn to. I cry all night and I'm tired. No one to support me. No one to care about me. I don't complain. Alhamdulillah for everything. Right? Just, you know, two paragraphs into the email, I'm already depressed. And all I keep hearing is, but I say Alhamdulillah for everything. I'm not upset. Really? Like, that's not true. That's not true. And let me tell you what this is. It might sound insensitive, but it's, this is a lie. This is a lie. If you're depressed, say I'm depressed. If you're in pain, say I am in pain. If you're suffering, say I am suffering. I don't know how to deal with it. Don't say, oh, but alhamdulillah, I'm not complaining. So what was that then? What was that? So, I mean, just be true. Be, be honest with yourself. Because if you identify the problem, then you can find solutions. But you, if you keep lying to yourself and lying to others, I'm not complaining. I'm good. You're not good. The, your email is, is clear, right? And that's the issue. So we want to say things as true as they are. So when, when Hajar, she said, Allah is not going to let us down, it's not like she's saying, Alhamdulillah, I don't complain. No. She says, Allah is going to take care of us. She knows. She means it. She really means it. She has this level of trust. So then Ibrahim left. She's by herself. She's feeding her child. But she's got no lactation, no milk anymore. Because she's getting thirsty. There's no food. She looks around, she decides, hey, I can't just sit and expect, I have trust in Allah, but I can't sit down and expect things to change. That's not going to change things. You have trust in Allah, but trust in Allah means also you trust how Allah designed the universe. If I don't move my hand and drink the water, this cup is not going to fly into my mouth, right? It's not. So you can't trust Allah, oh, he's going to take care of us, but not trust him with how he designed the universe. The universe works, cause and effect. You want something to happen? Stand up, do it. Do it. If you sit down and say, I trust Allah, Allah will provide for me. You don't trust Allah. You don't trust Allah and you can't fool him. You're just fooling yourself. Because if you want to trust Allah, you trust Him in everything. 
You trust him in how he takes care of you. You also trust him in how he designed this world. That if you want this to move from here to there, you have to hold it in your hand and physically move it. They go hand in hand because both of these systems are from Allah. You can't trust Allah with one and mistrust him with the other. It doesn't work. So Hajar moves around. She starts looking for, for water. Could there be a source of water? How could they tell in the desert if there was water from a distance? Put your hand up if you know. How could you tell in the desert from a distance that there is water? How could they tell? Yes, birds would be hovering above. In the desert, birds are hovering above. From such a distance, you could see that, you tell there's water. Oh, you're right, yes. <laughs> Kit Kat? <laughs> okay. Can I throw it? Perfect. Good. Almost. But so she goes, she finds this hill, she goes on top of the hill and she looks around. If there is there any sign of water or any sign of people? Or and how would you know there's people? Right. Smoke. Yes. Because people cook. People use the fire at night as a source of illumination and uh, warmth so yes so smoke could be a sign of people all right so she looks around she doesn't find anything she goes to the second hill Safa small hill second hill or small mountain second mountain Al Marwa she goes she looks around doesn't see anything what does she do she goes again to the second one Sometimes we narrate the story as she's panicked and she's lost. No, she didn't, didn't lose trust in Allah, but she was trying hard. Maybe she missed, right? And that's why we do Asaf al Marwa. Anyway, when she's done that seven times, she hears a striking sound. She looks where her son is in the middle of the valley and she sees the water coming from the ground. Jibreel alayhi salam hit the ground with his wing. Allah commanded him to do so, water came forth. And you know what? Hajar did not say, like, I ran seven times, it's a long distance, and the water came from there. What a loss. It doesn't sound right, right? But we do that. All of us do it. I tell you what. You want to make a business, you start a project, you, worked hard, you work hard on it, you put months, years of hard work, sleepless nights, you spend some investment on it, and it doesn't work out. It doesn't work out. You're good with people, or you try hard with your studies, or maybe you have a family member, you try to help them out, you try to be good, right? It doesn't pay off. You don't get results. You don't get results. And what happens... Allah has his own way of giving you back. So sometimes you invest in a business, you work hard two, three years and it fails. But maybe five years later, a business idea comes to you on a silver plate. You don't do maybe 1% of what you did previously and it makes you a fortune. Right? You invest with a person, maybe a spouse, you want to marry them, etc. And you marry this person, and no matter how hard you try, this person is not setting themselves right. And you're traumatized, and you're divorced. Then you decide to marry anyone afterwards and not invest so much in the family. Why? Because you invested already and it didn't turn out to be good. So you don't invest with that person, you just marry them. And this turns out to be an angel. Right? Allah has his way of paying back. You invest. Do you know where this good came to you later on from? From your previous work. How come? There's no connection. There is connection. But we don't see it. It's with Allah. It's in the back end. It's behind the scenes. These are the links. So Hajar, when she saw the money, came, oh, the, the, the water came out from there. She didn't say, oh, I wasted my time. No. 
Again, so if you are doing well in any situation, you are being honest, true, sincere, and you do the right thing, even if things don't pay off, even if people take advantage of you, even if you know, everything breaks apart and you seem to be like naive because you did not resort to deception, to trickery, and etc. Don't think you're going to lose. Don't think Allah has his way of paying back, but not according to your expectations. He doesn't work for you. He doesn't work for you. He doesn't take orders from you. So don't expect things to work the way you want. Let Allah do his thing. Just open up. Hajar was like this. She saw the water. Perfect. She, she goes to the water, tries to contain it. She tries to contain the water. Oh. Allah must die. I just I just spilled the water. <laughs> Bye. I'm just getting too excited. But let's move this out. Learn the lesson. Uh, coffee. Bye. She goes, she contains the water, and in the Arabic language, this is called zam, zam, contain it, put, keep it intact. That's where zam, zam came from. And then the water is there, and she's drinking from it, and zam, zam is special water. The Prophet ﷺ says, zam, zam, ta'amu tu'min. The water of Zamzam is so nutritious that it could act like a food and it has medicinal abilities. It has healing abilities. So she drinks from this water, she feeds her son. Soon after, a tribe, a traveling tribe, they see the birds. They know, hey, there's people there. But they already know this valley and there's no one there. So how come there's birds and there's no water in that valley? So they send someone to go and check. He finds Hajar with her son, Ismail, and the water. And he says, how, like, wh how come? Where's this water from? He says, is it okay if we settle here? If we spend some time with you? She's lonely. She says, yes, you guys can come, settle here with me, but one condition, this water is mine. This water is mine. Again, bargain. Bargain. Yes, you go to the market. Yeah, they try to rip you off. Oh, no, no, I'm honest. They tell me 70 ringgit, 70 ringgit. Okay, let them set you up then. You're going to be taken advantage of. He tells you 70, tell him 40. Right? I mean, if it's, just figure out the price, right? The right price. So, she says the water is mine. Again, that means being a believer does not mean being naive. Doesn't mean being naive. It happens with husband and wife. Husband is abusive. Wife is so nice. No, I have to be obedient and nice. He takes your rights, doesn't treat you well, doesn't give you what you deserve. No, it's okay. I'll be patient. Well, okay. It's going to get worse. Most of the time, it's going to get worse. I'm not saying punch him in the eye. I'm just saying stand up for the rights. Because that's a relationship. And if it's not built on proper foundations, it's going to go downhill. And the ones to pay the price will be your kids. Will be your kids. So stand up for yourself for the sake of your kids and for the sake of your husband. Brothers, I'm going to tell you something. Sisters, you know, don't, you know, don't have an issue with me. I'm just going to say it. It's not necessarily bad, but brothers, who's married here? The brothers, who's married? Put your hand up, up, up. 
Okay. Who's not married? Yeah. Okay. This is a message from your future. <laughs> Brothers who are already married, they might, this might connect some dots for you. I'll tell you what a lady does. You go somewhere, you do something. Where did you go? What did you do? With who? What? What do you plan to do? Next month? Next year? What did you write here? Right? She wants to know everything. And you don't want to hide, right? You want to be clear. So you tell her everything. You tell her everything. She can read you like an open book. Then she finds you boring. Because you're very predictable. She knows you inside out. And she gets frustrated with you. You're boring. Then you tell her things. And she's going to have more questions. You get in more trouble. So what you want to do, tell your wife some things, and some things keep them as a surprise. Why? Because stay mysterious. <laughs> stay mysterious. Not completely. There's a sweet point. If you're too mysterious, she won't trust you. If you are too open and clear, you're too boring and dull. Literally. So... Generally speaking, a woman out of goodwill, she wants you to behave in certain ways. You behave in certain ways, she will hate you for it. So, but you told me to do this, right? Yeah, but I hate this. No. Again, so don't fall for this. So basically, is just find a sweet point, tell her enough to make her feel confident, but keep, keep enough to yourself that you will reveal later on. I tell you what. You're going through some financial difficulty. And there's a situation where you need 20,000 ringgit and you don't have it. And you have a debt of 30,000 ringgit. And you don't know what to, how to deal with this. You're stuck. You need the 20,000 ringgit like in five days. Two scenarios. I'm going to ask you. Sisters, answer me. If the man goes... And he comes to his wife and he says, you know what, I think I have this friend. I will go and ask him. I have my brother. I'm gonna, uh, I will ask him to help me out, maybe give me 5,000. And I have my cousin. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give them a call and I see if they can give me that. Then they go and they get the 20,000. Big deal? Not really. Second husband, the wife says to the husband, you know, how are you going to get the 20,000? Tell her, leave it for me. I'll figure it out. Right? He does the same thing. Calls his cousin, calls his friend, and tells them, don't tell no one, especially my wife. Right? And the wife is, wow, 20,000. What are we going to do? What are gonna, we going to do with this? And you're, you don't say anything. You're just cool. And then, when the time comes for the 20,000, your wife says, you know, what are we going to do now? You put your hand in your pocket. 20,000 ringgit. Really? She would love you for it. <laughs> right? You're mysterious. You're resourceful. So don't reveal everything. All right. Yeah. Young brothers, keep that in mind. It will help you. Because many brothers, they think, oh, I'm going to tell her everything. Do you know who did that mistake? Who reads uh, novels? Who loves literature novels? Who reads uh, Russian novels? No one? I'm the only one? Sorry. Who has ever read Tolstoy? Tolstoy. You know, Tolstoy made a mistake. He, in his youth, he was... Uh, a womanizer. He wasn't a good person. He did every sin, right? Then he decided to change his ways and decided to get married. So he finds this woman, he falls in love with her, and as a token, as a, a proof 
that he loves her so much and he, he wants to change his ways, he gives her all his diaries, everything, all his past, he's documented it in diaries. He gives it to her. Why? His message was, hey, this is a new start. I want you to know that I'm going to tell you everything. I want to make sure you know everything. I'm not going to hide anything from you. She reads the stuff. And that was before the, before the wedding. She reads all his diaries. What does she think? He probably doesn't want to marry me. He regrets it. And now he wants to get me to read these. So I hate him. And I say, I don't want you. He doesn't want to terminate the marriage from his side. He wants me to do it. So he's giving me all of these diaries, all of the bad things he did because he wants to end, end this marriage. And he says, but I'm not going to initiate it. If he wants to initiate the, the divorce or the termination of the marriage, he does it. So they get married. He tells her everything and she hates him for it. And then his whole life, by the way, is hatred between him and his wife. That's his life. Hatred. To the point that later on in his, in his life, he ran away from the house. He, he said to her, I don't, I don't want you. He runs away from the house. And he travels by himself. He gets sick. And she comes to see him and he hates it. He's dying. He's literally taking his last breath. She comes to see him and he hates the fact that she came to see him as he was dying. So guys, don't be like Tolstoy. Bye. So, Hajar, back to Hajar. <laughs> All right. Uh, so those tribe called Jurhum, they move to settle with with uh, Hajar and her son, and they settle there. Ismail grows among them. Okay. Ibrahim alayhi salam used to visit every now and then. When Ismail alayhi salam became about 12, 13 to 16, when he became a, like a young man, now he could help his father. Ibrahim alayhi salam sees a dream. And in the dream, he sees himself slaughtering his son, Ismail. A question. And I will give the whole basket to someone who can answer this question. How old was Ibrahim السلام, when Ismail was born? The whole basket and the coffee. Oh, okay. okay, do we have any hands? Just one hand here. Any hands? Hmm? No, no, that's a bit too much. And, huh? Close, close. Huh? You take the contents, not the basket itself. <laughs> yeah. Okay, questions with no gifts. Where's the basket? <laughs> Poor person. Now. Yes, he was 86. Do you realize that? 86. What does this mean? This means Allah is the one who set the rules. Allah is the one who set the rules for birth, age, etc. And if Allah wants, He can change them. He can change them. So, Anyway, Ismail becomes a teenager. Ibrahim sees that he's slaughtering his son. Now, the Prophet, Prophet Muhammad وسلم, says, The vision 
of prophets, when they see a dream, it's revelation. It's revelation. If a prophet sees a dream, it's revelation. It's a command from Allah. So Ibrahim understands. What does he understand? That Allah is commanding him to slaughter his son Ismail. Two days ago, I saw a video of a young Muslim sister. Uh, I think she's Canadian. And she says, you know, I've been asked about the story or we were taught about the story of Ibrahim and slaughtering his son Ismail. And she said, they taught, they taught us the story wrong. And Ibrahim saw the dream, but Allah did not want him to slaughter his son, but he misunderstood it. He thought, the Prophet Ibrahim thought, that the dream was a command. That's the problem. We have it clear in Islam that the dream of a prophet is true and real. And Allah told him to do something. And it's painful. And it's not easy. But you're dealing with Allah. What does this teach us? It teaches us that not everything in Islam we can understand it fully. Yes, the majority of Islam, we can understand it and make sense of it. But there are things that Allah kept to himself. And if we don't understand them, doesn't mean we don't accept them. Because that's the rule of the relationship between human and human. You say something, I'm going to think about it. If it doesn't make sense to me, I can say no. But with relationship with Allah, human being to Allah, if something is clear in Islam, probably, maybe it doesn't make sense to us. Maybe. There are things that we can't really wrap our heads around. We don't understand why. But the story of Ibrahim teaches us that if something comes from Allah, then it is good even though I don't see that. But I have to make sure that it comes from Allah because there are many issues in Islam that are disputed among these scholars. There are different opinions. And the opinions are sometimes equally strong. There are many issues that are not just black and white. You can't just because your teacher or your sheikh says thing, that's what Islam is, you start whacking at everyone with your opinion. No. With matters of difference of opinion among the scholars, especially matters of difference among the four madahib, we should be tolerant. We should be easygoing. We should accommodate the differences. It doesn't mean I don't follow what I see to be the truth. No, you do follow that. But when it comes to you telling people, hey, your madhab is wrong. You're against the hadith. You're against the Quran. No. Because these madahib that were served by hundreds of thousands of scholars throughout the time and the ages, and they are more sincere than you and I. So don't just say, think that they were fools putting these issues together, and you who just read a book or studied for two years, now you figure out everything. Be careful, don't fall into this. This is ego. This is a big ego behind that. So Ibrahim alayhi salam, he was commanded by Allah in the dream to slaughter his son. Now what happens? In their conflict, Ibrahim is obedient to Allah. Automatically he's obedient to Allah. But now this obedience to Allah goes against his nature as a father. And it's not only a father like, hey, waited, I waited for 86 years. And I was given my son now. And when my son now has become a little bit more independent and they, he can help me, now I'm supposed to slaughter him. It's, he has to resolve this conflict. But obviously for him it's resolved. But it's just a matter of dealing with this natural tendency of a father to not harm his son. But automatically he tells his son, he says, Ya Bunayya inni ara fil manami anni adbahuk. 
So he says, oh my son, I am seeing in my dream that I'm slaughtering you. Ismail knows. He says, ya abati fa'al ma tu'mar. He says, oh my dad, do what you are commanded. To, so according to the sister who had the video, who said, oh Ibrahim thought that Allah wanted him to kill his son, but that's not true. It was a misunderstanding. Well, Ismail as well got the wrong impression. Right? No, Ismail also got it right. It was clear. It's a, it's a command from Allah. So he says, oh my dad, do what you're commanded. Now, we don't want to take this as some kind of a distant story. You know what that means? You're a young man and now you, you're willing to let yourself be sacrificed against the survival instinct. Like his, his father told him, I'm commanded to slaughter you. Automatically, he says, do it. Now, what kind of obedience is this? What kind of obedience? You know, it, it, it takes a lifetime of devotion, dedication, and self-purification to even get close to that. That I know if Allah says something, it's good. And by the way, the scholars of Islam are agreed, all of them, that when something is, an, when we say wajib, Obligation, it means it is a synonym. It has the same meaning as beneficial and good. Because Islam itself is structured the way Allah made the halal, the haram, the wajib. All of that, Allah made it based on what? Good and bad. Whatever is wajib is good. And whatever is haram is harmful. Automatically, there's no question about this. Literally, there's no question. So the word haram automatically should be translated in your mind harmful, bad for you. Could be physically, could be emotionally, could be socially, could be spiritually, could be intellectually, could be so many things. Keep that in mind. Haram means harmful. Automatically. So any kind of ideas, oh, you know, why does Allah make this haram? It's good. No, that's a contradiction in terms. It's a contradiction in terms. Because sometimes we are biased when we identify something as good. Why? Because we don't see the consequences, the long-term consequences. We don't see them. So the reason, Allah, and that's why Allah says in the Quran, يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ بِكُمُ الْيُسْرَ وَلَا يُرِيدُ بِكُمُ الْعُسْرَ Allah wants ease for you. Allah doesn't want hardship. doesn't want to put you under hardship. And it's not like, okay, like, but, you know, sometimes Islam is hardship. Because when you do the haram, it's harmful. It's going to lead your life to be hard. It's going to lead your life to be hard. Yesterday I was listening to uh, a thinker uh, who specializes in capitalism. And he says, the reason we have a crash, like 2008, and they're expecting a, a coming crash anytime soon, right? Where everything, the whole economy of the world collapses. And the ex experts, they say, you know, this is capitalism in its own nature. It has to crash every now and then. And it happened from the eight, from the 17th century on. It kept happening at intervals. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants ease meaning whatever Allah commands you with, and whatever Allah prohibits you, all of that makes things easy for you. And not only in this world, in the next in the next. So, Ibrahim السلام, and Ismail السلام, they know that. But it's painful, killing your own son, sacrificing your own life. They know it's good. Why? Because good and bad, there is immediate and there is long term. Most of the time, we are attached to the short term, immediate immediate results and that's our problem but we don't see the long consequences you know what i was reading in the literature of 
rape victims. Do you know when a child, for example, gets raped, the trauma and the pain lasts for at least six generations? In average. Six generations down the line are affected by that act of rape. And the person who raped, are they thinking about this? Are they aware? You destroy not only the victim's life, the life of their children, and the life of their children, and their children, and their children, and their children, and their children. You're in your grave, and 200 years down the line, there are people suffering from an act, a decision you made at one moment. Right? And not only these people suffer, their spouse as well suffers. So how many lives have you destroyed? And everyone who's close to them suffers. So when Allah makes something haram, we might see something attractive in it, but we don't see the long term. And by the way, almost, almost everything that is haram has benefit in it. There is, like, it's very rare in this world that there is something that is completely good and there is very rare that something that is completely bad. I'll look at what Allah says about some of the kaba'ir, the major sins. Allah says, يَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الْخَمْرِ وَالْمَيْسِرِ قُلْ فِيهِمَا إِثْمٌ كَبِيرٌ وَمَنَافِعُ لِلنَّاسِ They ask you about alcohol, intoxicants, and gambling. Tell them they have a lot of harm and some benefits. And some benefits. Almost everything in the world has some benefit. Does rape have some benefits? It does. But the harm is far bigger. Riba, interest, is there benefit in it? Absolutely there's benefit in it. But the harm is bigger. Anything that is haram, anything, is there benefit in it? Yes. Except in very extreme cases. So when people justify something haram, they use the benefit side of it and they cancel the other part of it, mostly because it's long term, the, harm, the harmful part. So Ibrahim and Ismail alayhim salam, they understood that. They know. Yeah, it's painful now. But since Allah said do it, it must be good. It must be good. Trust Allah. I'm going to ask you a question. And this is going to, inshallah, I'm going to talk about this on Sunday. For those who are going to attend. Because Surah An-Nas and Surah Al-Falaq are so much about tawakkul, by the way. A connection most of us don't do. Who has ever been on a roller coaster? Put your hand up. Oh, okay, good. Hmm, mashallah. Do you guys have big roller coasters here? Okay, where? Tell me. I love them. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, on a roller coaster, first, you want control, right? You're scared. But then you realize it's too much, so you just let go. Just be it, right? On a roller coaster, that's what you do. That's exactly what tawakkul is. Well, it's painful, it's scary, right? You're going to drop. You're going to fall. Right? You just say, hey, just go with it. Ibrahim and Ismail alayhim as -salam, father slaughtering his own son after having waited for 86 years to get his son. And his son has just become a young man. Now you're going to kill him. Just go with it. Obedience to Allah. Just like you go with the roller coaster, let it be. Leave, you know, relinquish control, give up on control. Just go with it. Let it lead you. Let the command of Allah lead you. And you know, when you show that to Allah, that's what Allah wants. If you show that to Allah, the world, the universe will treat you differently. It will treat you differently. 
And that's exactly what happened with Ibrahim and Ismail. So Allah says, فَلَمَّا أَسْلَمَا وَتَلَّهُ لِلْجَبِينَ When they submitted, they were going to do it. Now, every cell in the body of Ibrahim was saying, that's your son, Ismail. His own life, survival kicks in. They just go. Aslama, they submit to Allah. Allah lead our way. And you know, if you do this in Salah, you're going to get khushu'ah. Because in, in Salah, we try to focus, right? Once you try to focus, I mean, you're going nowhere. Because you think you make khushu'ah, but you don't make it. What you should do, let Allah lead the way. You just get in your salah and let Allah lead you. Just let Allah lead you. Literally. Yeah. Stop trying. Literally. Stop trying to do khushu'ah. Just like you stand in Allah, let your heart say, Oh Allah, just take me on this, on this journey. You take me. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna do what you want. I'm gonna say everything. I'm gonna be there. Show me what you're gonna give me. I'm just gonna, you, you lead my way. I promise you do this and you will find Khushua there. You will find it. Try it out. Just stop trying to produce Khushua because you can't produce it. You can't. All right. At that moment, وَنَادَيْنَاهُ أَيَّا إِبْرَاهِيمُ قَدَ صَدَّقْتَ الرُّؤْيَا We called him out. O oh, Ibrahim, you have been truthful to the command that you saw in the dream. You were truthful. Because if you are obedient, you're truthful. Because you're true. You say, Oh Allah, you know, I don't know. Then Allah says, don't take interest. You go and take interest. Do you know when you take interest what you're saying? You're saying, oh Allah, I know better. You're saying interest is harmful, haram, but I think it's good. So I know, I know better than you, Allah. That's why every sin that is committed by a believer is an act of lying. You're lying to yourself because you know something is haram, meaning harmful. You say to yourself, in order to do it, it's good. Because you won't do it. If you don't think it's good, you won't do it. If you don't think there's value in it, you won't do it. Human behavior is based on value. If we see value, we act. We don't see value, we don't act. So when you act, you see value, good. So you go for it. So you lie to yourself. You lie against Allah. That's what Allah said. Qad صَدَّقْتَ الرُّؤْيَةِ You've been truthful to the command, to the dream. Because Allah said, it is good for you to obey Allah here, to do the slaughter. And everything inside you says no, but you went with Allah. You're being truthful. Then Allah says, Inna kadalika najzil muhsinin. That's now I'm going to show you how. Allah says, Now I'm going to show you how I reward the ones who do ihsan, meaning the ones who do the best, the highest level of ihsan, which is highest level of iman, right? You worship Allah as in the hadith. Ihsan is you worship Allah as if you see Him. And if you don't see Him, you know He sees you. So you're sure when Allah says haram, although you can't see how harmful it is, you just believe. You just believe. And they call this blind faith. No. That's not blind faith. When you question the command of Allah, that's blind reason. That's blind reason. Faith cannot be blind. It cannot be blind. True faith. Then Allah says, إِنَّ هَذَا لَهُوَ الْبَلَاءُ الْمُبِينَ This is indeed the real test. This is the real trial. This is the real test. So the real test in life comes with, down to sacrifice. 
sacrificing what you value the most. You know why? What was the test of Ibrahim? Who is more important to you, Allah or Ismail? That was the choice. You have to choose Ibrahim. You have to choose Allah or your son, Ismail. Which one you're going to choose? That was the whole thing behind it. So every Eid, if you do the Qurbani, remember this. That the story of Ismail is about testing Ibrahim. Who do you put first? Allah or Ismail? Let me see. Not in words. Alhamdulillah. I don't complain. I'm feeling good. Right? Don't do that. Allah is going to put you to the test. Do you truly believe in Allah? And is Allah number one? Is Allah Akbar for you? As you say it every salah? Or is your son Akbar? Or is your wife or husband Akbar? Or is it your house or your car or your money or your reputation? Which is Akbar? That's the real test. So Allah says that's the real test. And you proved that you're going to put Allah first even if it means losing your son. Since you proved the point, there's no need for your son to go. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, And we ransomed him with a great animal for slaughter. Then at the end, Allah says, إِنَّهُ مِنْ عِبَادِنَا الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Indeed, he is from our believing servants. That's where belief comes to. If you're willing to sacrifice, because sacrifice means choice. Choice. You have two things to choose from. You have to choose one and leave the other. That's what sacrifice is. Which one you choose is the most important to you. That's what sacrifice is. Sacrifice is you have two things to choose from. You have to take one and leave one. You can't have them both. Which one are you going to choose? We said human behavior is based on value. Value. So if you choose Allah, he's number one in your life. If you choose other things, Allah is not number one in your life. You can say as much as you want, Allahu Akbar. You can say, I love Allah. You can say, I'll do anything for Allah, right? That doesn't mean anything. It's not about what you say. It's about al-bala'ul mubin, the real test. You know, they said one day there was the uh, Pope of the Vatican he, had, uh, he was diagnosed with heart failure, like they were expecting his heart to fail. So he was having their congregation and he uh, appeared from the balcony and he said to the masses, thousands of people, and he said, I was diagnosed with heart failure. And basically the doctor said that if I don't get a heart donated, then... I will li I will, I'm likely to die very soon. So some people said, we'll give you our hearts. I'll give you our heart. Someone said, I'll give you my heart. I'll give you my heart. He said, no. What we will do, we'll throw this feather. And if it falls, when it falls on someone's head, we'll take the heart of that person. So they throw the feather and everyone says, take my heart. <sighs> take my heart. <sighs> Take my heart, right? <laughs> so, we do this with Allah. We do this with Allah. We say, إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُ وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ We say, oh Allah, we worship you. It means we love you the most. We fear you the most. We want you the most. Right? You don't want to be like someone who says, إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُ وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ Don't do that. Don't do that. Say it. And mean it. And by the way, sacrifice is not only in the story of Ibrahim. We are making sacrifices. Because life is full of choices. Life is full of choices. And you know what? Some sacrifices, you can approach them and seek from them. Some sacrifices come to you. Ibrahim sacrificed 
came to him. He had to choose it. Some sacrifices, you choose them. You say, I want to get into charity work. Right? You, get it, you help out a charity, what are you going to do? You're going to spend a lot of time away from your family, right? You're going to travel a lot. You're going to help the poor. You're going to put yourself in difficult situations. You chose to make this sacrifice, right? You walked to it. You, cho you chose it. But some sacrifices just come to you. And you can't go anywhere. You have to make a choice. And one of the sacrifices that come to you is that your life Because you're spending your time. You can't stop it. Whatever you use it for, you're making a sacrifice. You know what? And that's what I'm going to close with. Then I'll take your questions. Allah, what does he say about the hypocrites and about the people who reject faith? Those are the ones who purchased this life by sacrificing the next. By the way, every transaction you do, sacrifice. You buy a car, you sacrifice the money, cash, right? Work, you sacrifice your time, your effort, and your skill and attention and your presence to get the money, funds. Uh, You get married, you sacrifice your freedom, <laughs> right? <laughs> a mother, you have children, you sacrifice almost everything, right? Your, your physical body, even your physical beauty, your time, your, even your time of ease, your nights, your life. Really, as a mother, you sacrifice your life. For a child, because you see value. So we're all making sacrifices, by the way. But make your sacrifices wisely. Because, by the way, people who follow their desires and they disbelieve, they're making a big sacrifice. What? They're sacrificing paradise. That's why Allah said, they purchased this life by sacrificing, by paying paradise. As, as, a, as a price. You don't want to do this sacrifice. Do the right sacrifices. Because if you do the right sacrifice, do you know what happens? Ismail was not slaughtered. He was saved. You'll get both. So that's why if you sacrifice this life for the next, you'll get both. Your life will be more meaningful, will be more productive, It will be rich. That's Allah's promise. When you sacrifice, or you make the right choice and uh, the right choice and sacrifice, you can never lose. Literally, you, you just even if you try to lose, you can't lose. You can't. So this is the story of the sacrifice of Ibrahim. Every Eid, Al-Adha, we should recall that. We're making a sacrifice. Now you guys made a sacrifice. You sacrificed your time and your effort to commute and come here and give two hours of your time. That's a sacrifice. And you were expecting more value. Otherwise you would not sacrifice that time. Because you could have done something else. But you felt this had more value than whatever else you wanted to do. That was a sacrifice. I hope it was a good sacrifice though. <laughs> Shall we go for questions? Time. Yeah, I'm going to end abruptly here, but I can take questions. I don't know. Uh, yeah, If anyone has a question, they want to ask the question on the mic, go ahead. If anyone wants to write it down... Uh, Well, we can take them, inshallah. But I, I have a trouble reading handwriting. So I'll just need to... Huh? You can take two questions and then we can use Three questions? Okay. So Brother Ammar says, we'll take three questions and then we'll close, inshallah. <laughs>